Hi guys and welcome to the first video of unit 3. This video is going to start out our gases unit and in this first video we're going to talk about the characteristics of gases as well as pressure, um, the pressure units, and we're going to briefly touch on the kinetic molecular theory to get us started. So characteristics of gases. All elements that are gases at standard conditions are nonmetals. So typically, almost all nonmetals are gases at standard conditions, with a few exceptions. Um, bromine, iodine are two of the big ones that exist as liquid and solid, respectively, um, at standard conditions. Everything else, every other nonmetal, is a gas. Um, all compounds that are gases at standard conditions are covalent. So notice the difference here. We have elements are nonmetals, the compounds are covalent compounds. Usually they're simple formulas um, with relatively low molar masses. Um, typically the higher the molar mass you get, the more complicated the formula. Um, usually the stronger the intermolecular forces and so um, the more tightly held the molecules like liquid and, and solids. Um, gases of all elements or compounds have similar physical properties. So typically all gases have similar physical properties what differs the most are the chemical properties. Um, so the physical properties will be similar. Physical properties, or excuse me, the physical properties will be similar. Chemical properties will be different. Um, and then substances that are liquids and solid at standard conditions, they can exist as gases. Um, but typically we don't call them gases. We usually call them vapors, like water vapor um, or gasoline vapor. Um, that kind of tells us that at standard conditions, usually it's a different state of matter. Um, some other properties of gases. So when we compare uh, gases to solids and liquids, um, in terms of volume, a gas is mostly empty space. Um, so it can be readily compressed. So gases are highly compressible, meaning that you can push them down into a very small volume. Um, or it can expand to fill a large volume. Um, so what this is saying is that gases will take the volume of its container. And then in terms of density, um, gases have very, very low densities um, because the mass of a gas occupies a significantly larger volume um, than an equal mass of, of a solid or a liquid. So that's why um, you know steam has a much uh, lower density than water or ice. So in terms of gases that do not chemically react, so if you have two or more gases that don't chemically react, but they just combine with each other, they form homogeneous mixtures. So an example would be air. Um, the air around us has carbon dioxide, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, all of these gases that are not reacting, they form a homogeneous mixture. Um, and then gases also have what's called a high entropy. Um, the word entropy here means disorder. Okay, so entropy is the same thing as disorder. We'll talk much more about entropy later um, in second semester, but what this is saying is that um, gas particles are very disordered. They're very chaotic as they move around. Um, this picture here shows us particle diagrams of a solid versus a liquid versus a gas. So notice uh, one mole of aluminum, which is 27 grams, occupies this 10 milliliter space. So solid particles are very, very close together. Um, liquid particles, so liquid in this case, if they're water molecules, um, they're still pretty close together, but they have the flexibility to move around and they just move past each other. Um, but then gases, look how spread out these gas particles are. And so just the difference in, in the particle diagrams is, is very important as we're looking at states of matter. So then, when we're looking at gases, pressure is very, very important. Um, the pressure that is exerted by a gas is caused by the collisions of the gas particles. So you can think about pressure in terms of collisions when we're thinking about gas. Um, so they're caused by the collisions of the gas particles with the walls of their container and the collisions with other gas particles. So the magnitude of the pressure depends on how often and how forcefully the particles will strike the walls or strike each other. So the more collisions, the higher the pressure. The fewer the collisions, the lower the pressure. Um, in everyday terms, pressure is the amount of force that's applied to an area. 
So we can calculate it as pressure equals force over area. Um, atmospheric pressure is actually the weight of air per unit area. Um, and atmospheric pressure is actually calculated by using this barometer. Uh, we'll talk more about barometers in a little bit. Um, but atmospheric pressure usually stays around 1 atm. So for units of pressure, um, we have a pascal. So 1 pascal is equal to 1 newton over meter squared. This is the SI unit. Um, this is the standard unit of pressure. Typically, we don't use pascals. Um, we'll usually use kPa, kilopascals. Uh, but the pascal is the SI unit of pressure. Um, the bar is actually becoming much more popular um, in today's chemistry world. Um, so one bar is actually equal to 100 kPa. Um, and so that's going to be the one bar. So if you're ever asked to convert between bar and something else, um, one bar is equal to 100 kPa. Um, and then we have millimeters mercury or tor. These are actually the same. It's just the difference in measuring the height of mercury in a barometer. And then atmospheric pressure we have at the bottom down here. Atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere um, or 760 torr or 760 millimeters mercury or 101.325 kPa. So with pressure, um, some other units we can have are PSI, so pounds per square inch, um, atmospheres or ATM, millimeters mercury, torr, Sometimes you might see inches of mercury, um, pascal, kilopascal, and the bar. So there are a lot of different units that can be used for pressure. Typically, we will use ATM, we will use KPA, we will use TOR. So those are kind of the big ones. Um, but you do need to know all of these conversions in case you're asked to go between them. Um, so these are all conversion factors that you can use. So one ATM. 1 atm is equal to a lot of things. 1 atm is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch. 1 atm is also equal to 101.325 kPa. 1 atm is also equal to 760 millimeters mercury or 760 torr. So all of these are equal, which means you can actually go directly from pounds per square inch to torr by using the relationship 14.7 pounds per square inch is equal to 760 torr. So these are the conversion factors that you can use to go between pressure units. So what I want you to do is I want you to use the unit conversions on the previous slide to convert the following. So pause it, do this, and then continue on with the video. So what we're going to look at next is actually measuring the pressure of collected gases. Um, you guys will be finding uh, the molar volume of a gas and you're going to actually be collecting the gas in um, a specific instrument. So when you're measuring the pressure of the gas, um, really the principle that we can use is that the pressure on a gas is equal to the pressure of a gas. So think of it like a balloon, right? The pressure that's on the outside of the balloon, the atmospheric pressure, is equal to the pressure that's inside the balloon because it's not inflating or deflating. So as long as it's not inflating or deflating, pressure A, which is on the outside, is equal to pressure B. So when we look at measuring gases, there are a few different pieces of equipment we can use. The first one is a udeometer. A udeometer is the same thing as a gas collecting tube. This is what we use in the molar volume labs. Um, it almost looks like a burette, um, but one end is closed, or it looks like a very long, thin uh, test tube. A manometer is an instrument that's used to measure the difference between atmospheric pressure and the pressure that's inside a vessel. So this picture here shows a manometer. And then a barometer is just an instrument to measure atmospheric pressure. Barometers are actually very hard to come by now. They're difficult to come by is because they're filled with mercury. Uh, the mercury barometers are the most precise, but they're very difficult to find. With a barometer, this just measures the air pressure, and the way that a barometer works is that the air pressure actually pushes down on the mercury that is in the tube, and the mercury can move in and out of the tube, and based on the air pressure, you just measure the height of the mercury, and that actually tells you atmospheric pressure. Okay, so now we've talked about pressure 
Now to get into gas laws and the relationships between all the variables, we're going to look at standard temperature. So standard temperature is just a reference temperature, which is zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. When we look at gas laws, we look at Kelvin and not Celsius. So I want you to think really quick, why would we use Kelvin and not Celsius? Kelvin has no negative numbers. Zero Kelvin, everything stops. All movement stops. So we use Kelvin in all of our gas law problems, but standard temperature is either zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. So standard temperature, this is STP, right? Standard temperature and pressure. This is not the same as standard state. Standard state is 25 degrees Celsius. Standard temperature and pressure, STP, is zero degrees Celsius. So there is a difference. Standard pressure is normal atmospheric pressure. That is 1 atm or 760 torr or 760 millimeters mercury or 101.325 kPa. STP, standard temperature and pressure, 273 Kelvin, 1 atm. The other important piece of information to use is the molar volume of a gas. So the volume of one mole of a gas at standard temperature and pressure is equal to 22.4 liters. So again, in order to use molar volume of a gas, you have to be at STP. You have to be at 273 Kelvin and 1 atm. If not, you can't use molar volume of a gas. You have to use the ideal gas law or, or something else. So the last thing that we're going to talk about is the kinetic molecular theory. And the reason that we're going to talk about this kinetic molecular theory right now is because we're going to start looking at gas laws. So each of the gas laws that we're going to look at tells us what happens in nature. It tells us what is happening, but it doesn't tell us why. And so what we're going to look at first is we're going to look at the why behind gases. And the why is the kinetic molecular theory. So the kinetic molecular theory is just an explanation of the characteristics and properties of gases. So why do gases act the way that they do? So we have some assumptions that we have to use uh, when we're dealing with gases. The first one is the gases are composed of a large number of particles, so either atoms or molecules, that behave like hard spherical objects that are in constant random motion. So you're going to find as we go through these postulates, I've underlined and bolded some words. Those are key words. Key words for this first postulate is that gases are moving in constant random motion. And then these particles have insignificant volume compared to the total volume of the gas. So each of the individual particles are so small compared to the total volume of the gas that we can say that most of the gas is empty space between the molecules. And then the third is that there is no repulsion or attraction between the gas particles. And so they're not attracting, they're not repelling, they're simply moving around in the container. The fourth is that when particles of a gas collide, a small amount of energy might be transferred, but the average kinetic energy remains constant. So what this is saying is that energy is conserved among all of the collisions that are occurring. These are called elastic collisions. So elastic collisions mean they collide and then they immediately bounce off with pretty much the same energy that they had before. Here's an example of some elastic collisions. So this is known as a Newton's cradle, and when you pull one of the metal spheres back and you let it go, these are elastic collisions. Now, assuming there was no friction, these spheres would just keep moving because they transfer all of their energy into the sphere next to them. And then the average kinetic energy of the gas particles depend only on the absolute temperature. Absolute temperature meaning Kelvin. Um, samples of different gases at the same temperature will have the same average kinetic energy. So I'll say that one more time. Samples of different gases at the same temperature have the same average kinetic energy. Temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. Just like I said on the previous slide, temperature of a sample of gas is a measure of the average kinetic energy. So the faster the particles are moving, the more kinetic energy they have and the higher the temperature. So any gases at the same temperature have the same kinetic energy. Write this down, star it, circle it, highlight it, whatever you have to do. This is a question that's missed almost every year. Gases at the same temperature have the same kinetic energy. So that's going to be important as we talk about the relationship between temperature and pressure and volume. The more kinetic energy they have, the higher the temperature. 